morning of retirement. I was in short stream stem with my sister. And I remember hearing the lids and whatever and people getting up and shouting and squinting in the streets. And we had we'd run out. And I remember clearly this young fella getting to a lip with no clothes on. A pair of underpants, no clothes on. And his mother running behind the salad and or was the salad and we called it then with um, a pair of trousers trying to throw in her son, you know. I got arrested on October the 15th, 1972, and it was me and the brother was picked up, I'd say. And we were brought up to, what is it, Black Mountain, and they put us up, two of us up against the wall, and it was all plain clothes, Brits. Four of them came behind us and just stood there and didn't do anything for just a second, just no sniggering and laughing. And, and one of them lifted the brother's treasure leg up and with a cigarette later and they weren't him. I mean, I could feel angry about it. I could feel like the humiliation of my parents having to leave their home. Uh, it was, I mean, there was eight of us, or eight kids, the youngest. At that time, would have been one. I'd have been four, you know, and that would right through to the oldest would have been 14. So they had to pack up from their home and walk along in the coach and move out in the middle of the night. As I've always heard about the peace specials, and I can remember actually coming up the turf lodge, and uh, I can actually remember at the top of the steps and all the men were out. And they were screaming what the beast specials were coming in, and all the men actually ran down the steps away from them. And I actually remember running up into my mummy and daddy's bedroom and hiding underneath the hiding underneath the bed because the beast specials were coming. Living in that district, you had Maggie's factory overshadowing the house. It was only 30 yards from your front door, but nobody in the family ever worked on it. And they were always conscious of that nobody in the district worked on that I knew of. And uh, that was always a bone of contention. Because most of my brothers end up having to go to sea, following the dad's footsteps, join the Mercian Navy. It was a general, gentle progression. And I felt it was my duty to do whatever I could to help my people and my community. Young fellas that probably if the troubles had never started would never have been in trouble before. And to me I'm talking hundreds of young fellas going into jail and are willing to go to jail, are willing to give their lives for something that they believed in. I think that I felt that I had a duty when I seen what my own people were going through and what, what they were experiencing. And I think that I was also aware that this wasn't anything really different than what previous generations, like my father's generation, my mother's generation, has, had been through. You always expect to be arrested or else you always expect to be shot. Uh, so you know you're either going to get killed or be arrested. You know something's going to happen to you. So when it did happen, it wasn't a big surprise. I remember saying to my, my mother, Mommy, don't let them annoy you. Don't let them annoy you. Right? Because she was getting, she was upset mm -hmm. over my dead body. She said she'll take, they'll take her. Right? So, and the dead, and I was taken to um, Castle Bay. There's a lot of stories about Castle Bay. Uh, people may say it's propaganda, or people may say it's lies, but I mean, it, it is true what happened in, uh, at that period. There was a lot of beatings going on. There was always one special branch man that spoke about in our house, and it was Harry Taylor. And my father used to tell stories about this guy called Harry Taylor. Right. So when I got into Castle Ray, this man came in, and he says to me, and I says, yeah, and he says to me, I'm Harry Taylor. Right. So I had met this icon, so, so to speak, 
of um, brutality. It was all Paris. It was about 12 o'clock Sunday. So I started questioning, I mean, I just says, look, I don't know what you're talking about, blah, blah, blah. The usual answers that you were given, because you didn't know anything anyway, so... I turned around and they says that I had information that I had killed a soldier. So they says to get out of the chair and to lie on the floor. So I got out of the chair and stood up. And they say lay on the floor, and I says no. So the other four come in and put me down on the floor, and two of them sat, one on each leg, and a soldier came in with a red bucket. I can remember as clear as a bell. Red bucket was full of water and a blue towel. And the wee Brit that was standing up says, you know what we're going to do with this? And I says no. And he just put it over my face and I could just feel the pressure and I'm getting pressed down on it and next thing I could feel the water trickling down it and through it I started coughing and spluttering and it just kept going the water through you just slowly start suffocating and you can just feel the breath leaving you and I could feel myself just lost in it and all of a sudden it stopped I took a towel off and all they were all laughing. And then they started questioning me again. And then I'd done this another, what, at least four or five times. Still the same response, still the same attitude that was pouring the water through. You were still gagging, still choking. Just, they must have done this on X amount of people because I had it down to a T. They just knew when you were about to pass out, and just before you passed out, they stopped. I was taken to the nesting hut. And when I went into this nesting hut, it was the, the Queen's Crest and the carpets and the, the hospital screen. So they asked me to come behind this table, and I said, no, I didn't want to sit. It was my hearing, and I was entitled to sit wherever I wanted. Right. So I think I just thought I was being a pain in the ass and just says, I can let her sit wherever she wants, right? So I sat in front of the table. So the commissioner came in, right? And of course they all stood up, I didn't. I refused to recognise this one. And he sat down and they began to read out these charges, which the detainees were presented with. And it would range from um, organising, um, carrying weapons, in possession of, you know, this sort of thing. And what they had was, they had what they called evidence in camera, right? And they also had evidence where this person would be brought in behind this hospital screen to give evidence against you, right? And remember that you weren't allowed to have a solicitor present, you know? So it was a complete mock-up of a so-called court. So what happened was, it was taken out during the camera evidence and brought back in again, right? And next thing, this guy with brown boots appeared behind the screen and he had an English voice, English speaking person and um, he began to, to frame off these allegations, right? So, as I say, I knew exactly what I was going there for, you know, and I knew I wouldn't be back. So I got up, I first of all ran over to the, the commissioner to took a water around him. I then run, this time they're all running after me, like, uh, and I got the hospital screens and I flung them and there behind was this person, right? And that was the whole court and just, there was chaos. And I was grabbed by the male warders and I was punched and I was kicked. And at one stage, one of the female warders had, was crying, leave her alone, you're gonna kill her, right? So I, I passed out. I was still groggy, next thing I could feel my head getting covered, I pulled a hood over my head and pulled it tight. And I said, you're going for a wee ride now. So I got me into the car and this wee Brit starts tapping me in the leg. And he says, you know what this is? He says, I says, no, it says it's a gun. I says, this is your last drive. 
He took me up to Glen Kern and I took a hood off my head. I says, do you know how many days have been done up here? And I says, no. And he says, well, you're going to be the next one. They started asking me about that. The soldier again. And I still starting to waver a wee bit then. The next thing he cocked the weapon. And he says, can I ask you one more time? Did you shoot the soldier? And I said, yes. Next thing this officer walks in and he says, before we start, the things that we've done on you, we can do again. And so don't think that you're off the hook here. He says, we're going to tell you more or less a statement. You're gonna, we're going to tell us, we're going to tell you a statement and you're going to sign it. So the Brits started telling me that more or less how the power was shot, where he was shot from, so on and so forth. So I related that back to him and he says, right, sign it, so I signed it. But as I was coming around, they were bringing Alan Welch out of the other listen hut from where her hearing was. And I could see Anne running towards me, but it was like slow motion. And Anne had long hair. And next thing I could see these hands on Anne's head and smacking her head off this wall, right? And I was trying to reach out to her. And that's all I remember. When I came round, we were back on the helicopter. And there was a soldier. And he was at my clothes. At this stage, my tights were torn off, coat was torn off. Um, I wasn't aware of blood then, but he was at my clothes, and in my defence, it was a, a reflex, you know, to push him away from me, right? But he was trying to put a bar of chocolate into my pocket, and he was crying, and he was saying to me, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, right? And I was still pushing him away, get away from me, get away from me, right? I and mean, I have never forgot that soldier. And he was young. He'd been running about the same age as me. They produced a 303. This was a week afterwards, by the way. And they says, is this the weapon that you fired? To kill the soldier, I mean, I haven't a clue what you're talking about. And the, uh, the cop was saying, go and take it, take it. No one see. I mean, I couldn't tell you. I'm not touching it. I don't know what you're talking about. They started laughing and walked out. There was no forensic evidence on me or on the weapon or uh, on the soldier. They described how the soldier was killed and, and where the bullet went. There was no bullet retrieved. All they had at the end of the day was the statement that I had signed. Friday pulled into court found guilty, um, sentenced to death. Got moved over to B-Wing. At B-Wing is where the death cell is. But Tuesday night, there's a John Wayne movie on. Cell door opens. Blah, 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 Mr. Whitelaw has signed a decree, you're reprieved. And I says to him, what does that mean? And he says, well, You've been committed to life imprisonment. He says you'll be moved to a cell and transferred to wherever the governor deems fit. Very polite. And I says, I'm not, I'm not stay here and watch the old film. But the governor came in the next morning and said you're being moved to Long Cash. Although they called it, as you well know, the maze prison. And sort of that was basically the start of 17 years in jail. When I actually got locked up, you got locked up at half eight. And when I sat in that cell, I was actually very, very frightened because I think that was the first time ever in my life that I had been on my own. Um, that nobody had been 
you know, with me. I mean, where I grew up, um, we it was in one of the bedrooms in Ballymurphy. You know, there was two big double beds, and there was six of us. It was three slept in one bed, and there was three slept in the other. Um, when you were staying out of the house, anybody's house you were staying in, you just, you know, bunged in beside their kids. Um, this was the first time ever in my life that, that I was on my own. I don't think I actually slept much that night, but it seemed like a lifetime, uh, you know, waiting on this door open again, like, to get out. Uh, having said that, um, staying on my own was something that I had to get used to very quickly. We went up into reception the next day into the blacks. If you were 18 at that time, uh, we would have been 19 then when we were sentenced. You get put in the YP wing and hits the... So the screws were waiting for us, put a slabber and put the gear on. It says we weren't putting the gear on, it was a monkey suit. They had it all folded up. We just wouldn't put it on. So they just stripped us, took our clothes off us, put us in the van, and then we went up into the blacks. There's no season here, there's no IRA. We tell you what to do, you know what I mean? Just the day of the cages is over. And that's the way it was in the crumb too. When we came into the crumb at the very start, the screws were very heavy handed. Paddy Joe Kerr was a POR black, and the screws were always seen Paddy Joe Kerr as a man's man, to use their terminology. And he was seen by the administration as an enforcer. Paddy Joe Kerr introduced the whole uh, sort of putting us over the table, uh, spreading our legs and searching up your back passage. The screws in the wing had gone to the OC and says that people were going to be strip searched, which was like again, <laughs> no I don't think so. Um, we said no, it wasn't going to happen, like uh, not with our cooperation. But like a year ago they had tried to push it in on the visits and now they were trying to push it in on the wings. And, um, we, and they were trying to like reason with you, you know, I mean, just this once. And I mean, you, all you have to do is like take your clothes off and put a sheet around you and then, you know, as if like this is all so simple and let's be reasonable here and get on and don't be making a fuss and it's just the once and then that'll not happen again. But I mean, that was the start of the day, which like turned into an absolute fucking nightmare of the day. You had anything up to about eight or ten screws going into a cell, and what they actually did was um, just attacked people. I mean, t attacked them, stripped them naked, held them on the floor, humiliated them, degraded them. So one by one, I mean, you were hearing your friends, people who were your comrades, just being attacked one at a time, and it was very, like, you had the whole range of feelings, like at times it was very frightening, it was very enraging, you know. I mean, all you wanted to do was kill them, you just wanted to kill the bastards. Uh, and then they introduced the mirror search. And the mirror search was different from the table, because it used to put you over a table like this, a square table, spread your legs, spread the cheeks, and then they would look up inside your backside if I thought they could see anything then they would get an AMO who would put his fingers up and pull out whatever was in your backside. They asked you to bend over the mirror, we refused to bend over the mirror so they, they ended up, they kicked the back of your legs, forced you down to a squat and then they slapped you about and then they pulled your cheeks apart looking for stuff inside you. And doctors actually came in and actually used like pliers to remove any object that was inside you. They came into Teresa and myself, we were sharing the cell and they came into us in the afternoon. We had barricaded the door, we had bunk beds in the cell and we put them up against the door and we had put um, whatever other, like wee lockers and stuff up against it. and. Um, then we had went to like the furthest point back in the cell, which isn't very far back at all because it's only a wee small cell. But we were actually at the window and we were holding on to the bars and we were holding on to each other. So what they were actually doing was coming in, holding the shields up in front of you and just in front of them and advancing and literally pinning you against the wall or the window or wherever you were, 
with the shield. And then they were just pulling the hair out of you. And we were hanging on to each other and they were trailing her out. And um, like then they got me down on the floor and I can remember my face sort of in the corner. I was face down. Somebody standing on the back of my legs. It was a screw. And, and you know, they pulled the clothes off me. And um, so I was left literally laying on the floor, naked clothes lying all around me. Um, I could hear the women, or the other women in the wing were shouting in, you know, the kind of just shouting support and they were shouting abuse at the screws. And then they just walk out and leave you lying there, you know, and stand at the door while you get dressed again, just stand and watch them, you know, so you just can't explain the rage. So, I mean, there wasn't a time that I thought about leaving the blanket, I didn't. Uh, there was times you wished the things which was happening and weren't happening. You like the beatings, you like the starvation. But there's times where you felt like, I love this fucking stuff, these bastards. When Bobby went on hunger strike, we knew that he wasn't coming off it. And he would talk out the door about, you know, keep keep your spirit up, don't be worried about me. Uh, we'll see this through and we'll get our five demands. Uh, but it was difficult because he was now like, we were eating our dinner every day, and we were eating our breakfast, and you felt guilty. Because up the top of the ring, Bobby was in hunger strike, and he wasn't eating anything. And I suppose one of the good times about it was during when Bobby was actually on hunger strike, he won the election. We had the wee radios in, in the wings at the time, no, the wee smuggled radios. I mean, we, we called them uh, Maggie, Maggie, Taggart, I think, was one, and the other one was called, was it Mary Dale or something? They had the name of Besanthers anyway, right? And there was just a wee plastic container, like a medicine bottle, with a wee crystal inside it, which you tag onto the pipes in the window and you were able to pick up. So we, we were listening to the results. So we knew when he died, when he went away. So everybody was shattered because that would have been a difficult time. Nothing would have been harder than watching people die. When the hunger strike ended, when the, the ten lads died in the hunger strike, uh, again it was confusing because it was talked about oh, we're going to go into the system. And you have to realise with ten men had died and people were saying well, we never got our five demands. If ten people die in hunger strike, uh, if they can't get it, everything, how are we going to get it? It's no use staying on the blanket. That's the end of the blanket. So the other argument was, we've got our clothes, that's the first step. Um, what we will do is we'll go down into the system and we'll fight within the system. When Ronnie Marley was appointed, the uh, camp escapes, he used to charge everything. And he went round in different wings and met with different guys in every wing. And uh, he says to him, if you want to take part in an escape, if you come up with an escape out there, give it to me and we'll see what we can do. Every part of the jail was covered and every part of it was mapped out and routined. If you knew the screws were on, if you knew what they were like, or the gamblers, they want to watch TV, they want to go to sleep. I was in the hits there for. And uh, at that time my dad died. I got out in pro. And this the second time I went back in, I was there for the gate. And at the front tally lodge, all the screws were sitting. Playing cards. And they're sitting playing cards with three decks of cards. And I'm shuffling them. And they're sort of fucking about being the mid. And I said, so I've never ever seen a game of cards. They use fucking three decks. So that's just where I'm sitting. But I'm not even taking these guys on a my notice. But I was, and I see the guys coming to the window of the tally lodge. There's all photographic passes, right? Because there's that many screws. And the hand passes in, passes out, passes out. See the last trick? On that sequence, you had to hand your photographic pass in and you had to get a playing card to go to the front gate. And see that bit of stamina rifle? 
See, we didn't hand him a playing card. You were in trouble. And that was the last, the last part of that jigsaw. Larry was working on, working on. His initial plan was to take out three blacks and the red and the SV Larry. And the screws were manipulated into the corner. It's one cup of tea. Let's have a match. And there's different art prisoners who'd be walking through a circle and reporting until they would see. The fucking bastards out there firing this and they had a fucking peel. And, uh, and all he was doing was just getting them ready for the big uh, fall. The lads in here at seven, uh, fair play to them, conditioned the whole situation up there, which allowed them to escape. It was their, their work, how they handled the screws, how they conditioned them, how they manoeuvred themselves into the season, which they were able to, to escape. And uh, for morale, it was brilliant. The preparation was just 100%. Larry put a lot of time and effort on top, and uh, I seen the intelligence of course that he was getting from in the jail. I had every base covered. Sunday morning came, and the bag got into possession, and the word came out. The, the signal was, see when he sends the bumper out, and uh, the bumper went out, and bang, within 15 seconds the whole bag was taken over. Now we were in the back gallery. Our mom was on the gate, open the gate. That was her left lap. See you in the film. So it was in the back gallery. And uh, the head is shouting the bomb. And I could look right down through the gates back into the camp. And the screws were all in the dish. What's going on up there? And, uh, and the commotion, one or two of them had got past. And so, uh, big ball shades and kids were in trouble. I was made outside, jumped out. And the, it was like I heard a cackle, all that boy said, where am I going? And the screws just went, fuck hell. 